brother back in the days before iPads, cell phones, video games, and even TV in most homes. Farm life activities were playing with our nearby cousins, going fishing in the river, building forts from the piles of fence posts, riding tricycles, and wishing there were trees on our lawn so we could play in the leaves. Luckily, our grandparents lived across the road in that gray house you see there. And they did have nice big trees with lots of leaves. So my brother and I talked with our grandfather, and he made us a deal. If we raked and bagged up the leaves, we could take them over to our lawn. <laughs> <laughs> and we only had to pay five cents a bag to do it. <laughs> That was my first lesson in economics. <laughs> and one of the ways my grandfather sought to teach us about business. He also had a loads of cedar fence posts delivered to our front lawn for my brother and I to sell. We paid grandpa the truckload price and then we got to sell them on a per post basis. Uh, and so made some profit. Through this business we also learned about location, location as related to uh, properly run business and success. We didn't have any trouble selling the post when we lived in East Homer on a busy state highway. But once my family moved to Kyler and we were on a little traveled road, uh, our sales dried up and our business died. <laughs> I'm very honored to be chosen as NOFA New York's Farmer of the Year. This isn't a point I've come to in isolation. But rather, it is because of the support, mentoring, and contributions of so many people. From partners and family and friends, to employees, advisors, and community members. Please travel with me to learn some about the environment that shaped, fostered, and cultivated my experiences in my evolution over the six decades of my life. I'd also like to share with you some of the lessons learned and hope my advice can be of benefit to many of you. I grew up in the 1950s and 60s when the division of labor by gender was strong. My mother ran the household and my father the farm, as it was the case with all farm families that I knew at the time. As I grew older, my responsibility was to help in the house and my brothers worked on the farm. Although I was drafted by my father a few times during haying season to drive the John Deere tractor with the uh, hand clutch to bale hay while he was on the wagon stacking the bales, or to share the work of unloading and mowing away hay. Somewhere in my mid-teen years, I read Rachel Carver's <coughs> Silent Spring. That book, which laid bare the deleterious effects of pesticides on the natural world, was a seminal part of my development and turned me into an environmentalist. I became a reader of Organic Gardening and Farming magazine and a practitioner of it as a, of organic gardening. Also during my teenage years, news of the women's liberation movement came into my world. A world where girls were not allowed to wear pants to my public school until I was in the 11th grade. But at the time, I was rather stuck in the mindset of being a conformist. And I didn't shelve wearing dresses to school every day until my senior year. Since then, though, you'll rarely find me in a dress. <laughs> About that time, I also dropped my habit of being a conformist and started thinking more for myself, rather than feeling I had to stay within the bounds and dictates of what the authorities believed or said. But at, that, <laughs> but at that time, I still didn't consider being a farmer. My thought as a high school senior was to pursue a degree in social work as I had a bent towards social justice and equality. I do want to add, though, that although the gender division of labor was practiced in my parents' household and farm, I never heard a discouraging word from either of my parents about needing to think only about or pursue traditional female roles. They left that choice wide open to each of us, myself and four siblings. 
40, 40 years ago this fall, I went to Cornell University to major in human development and family studies at the College of Human Ecology, which at the time had a tuition of only $800 a year when I was a freshman and $1,200 when I graduated. So a very affordable education compared to today. When it was time for me to think about what I wanted to do during the summer for employment, the thought came to me that here I'd grown up on a farm, but I didn't know how to milk a cow. And it was time to change that situation. I told my father that I wanted to work on the farm that summer, and I'd get up at 4 or 5 a.m., just like he and my older brother did. And his reply was, okay, if that's what you want. So my other older brother became my mentor that summer and taught me how to milk, how to drive tractors, how to operate the hay vine, and many other tasks. And I really enjoyed it. And looking back as a child, the main two imaginary things I used to do was playhouse and play farm. So maybe my subconscious knew that I had farming in my blood. I did the same the following summer. And the next summer after that, I worked on two other farms to gain broader experience. I also started taking all my electives in the ag school, including farm carpentry, where my brother and I built a hay wagon for our class project as we were both taking the same cl the class at the same time. I approached the rather old school professor about hiring me as a teaching assistant in the course for the next semester. But he said, no, no, we've got that all covered. I expect that he was thinking he couldn't imagine having a female student being a TA. But then, lo and behold, uh, the beginning of the next semester, he called and asked if I'd be willing to take the position after all. So I became the first female teaching ass assistant in the class known as Boards and Nails. <laughs> and then the next year, for the beginning welding class, arcs and sparks. <laughs> this time I didn't have to ask the professor. He prevailed on me to please take the teaching assistant position. Well, at Cornell, I did meet many other female age mates who were in the ag school and who were interested in producing, in pursuing agriculture as a career. A shift was happening to see women not just as farm wives, but as farmers themselves, as well as pursuing careers throughout the spectrum of agricultural services and businesses. <coughs> After college, I wanted to do volunteer service and found a position at a Navajo Methodist Mission School in New Mexico, where I was a supervisor in the girls' dorm, helped with maintenance and construction projects, and started and taught a woodshop program for the students. I stayed there for the school year and learned that I did not want to be in a school setting. Plus, I came to have an awareness of the injustice that had been perpetrated on many Native Americans who had been taken from their homes and many even forced to go to boarding schools to uh, strip them of their cultural heritage. Luckily, this school was phasing out that methodology. When that experience ended, and I was back to living and working at my parents' farm, um, my aunt by marriage and my uncle were up to visit one evening. She asked me, if her younger brother were to ask me out, would I say yes? I knew a bit about Rick Arnold, as I had <coughs> heard him sing and play guitar at a few events in the trucks and community over the past few years but I'd been too shy then to introduce myself. This time, I didn't hesitate to say yes, I would. So not quite 40 years ago, I formally met my husband-to-be. It took a couple years and a breakup our way through, but we were married over 36 years ago. At the time, Rick was working with his two brothers and mother on their family farm in Truxton. I was working part-time at another farm in Truxton, as by then, I moved from my parents' home and farm in Cairo to live in a cabin in the woods in the hills of Truxton. Rick and I were not quite sure where we were going to head once we were married, but that became clear soon after when his older brother was diagnosed with melanoma 
and given uh, very little chance to survive. He not only farmed, but he also taught school, so he, uh, off, faced with this health threat, he offered to sell his share of the farm real estate to Rick and I. And their mother, at age 65, decided she was willing to retire from the farm business. So on January 1st, 1980, Rick and I and his nine-year older brother, Bob, went into partnership together and Twin Oaks Farm was born. Prior to that start date, though, a generic general farm partnership agreement from our cooperative extension agent was revised into our formal partnership agreement. In any farm family situation, it is important to have things legally written down as to ownership, how purchasing decisions over a certain amount are to be made, how the agreement to can be revised, a buy-sell arrangement spelled out, and so on. These need to be thoroughly thought through and agreed on. A parent telling an adult child that one day this will all be yours if you just stay and work here is not good enough. Maybe it will happen, but maybe it won't either. And all the expectations someone may have had after years of hard work and sacrifice may very well go right out the window with the death of a parent, their descent into dementia, or just with a change of mind. If it is not in a legally binding document, there are no assurances. Please, all of you out there who are not in a secure position with your farming endeavor, please consider working to that end. It is oftentimes not easy, but there's lots of help out there from cooperative extension and FarmNet to farm credit consultants and others. In setting up our partnership, we did learn a lesson about choosing the right attorney. The lawyer we used lost the first partnership draft that we gave him, and then it was like pulling teeth to get uh, things accomplished. So be sure to choose an attorney who is well-versed in your legal needs and has a reputation for getting things done. We also had our house lots deeded out of the partnership property so that we each owned our own homes. Doing that eliminated the potential for conflicts by allowing each family to make their own decisions regarding investment and improvements in their own homes, rather than having to make a business decision about investing in a house. Rick and I built our house on the farm. We found a south-facing slope in one of the farm pastures and built an earth-sheltered, passive solar home heated by the sun and a wood stove. A good share of the lumber for our house came from logs Rick and Bob cut out of the farm woods that first winter, and the three of us sawed the logs out on a small sawmill on the farm. And then over the next year, the house arose, mostly from our own labor. As I look back now, it's almost hard to conceive that we had the time and energy to build the house while also operating a 70 cow dairy with no employees. Those were the days of young muscles and lots of energy. <laughs> and it surely helped greatly to have Rick's mother ask us to live with her, and that she cooked all our meals, did our laundry, and basically took care of us while we farmed and raised a house nearby. Family help and support can make such a difference in our lives, and I've been fortunate to be the recipient of a good deal of it. We moved into our mostly unfinished but livable house a year later. At that time in the early 1980s, there was no building code in New York State, so you didn't have to have a finished house to get an occupancy <coughs> permit before you could move in. So we basically camped out and then worked on it over the years to finish it. I still have some trim work yet to do. <laughs> In the early years of Twin Oaks Farm, we kept many of the existing farm practices at first and continued to pasture the milking cows during the lush grass growth of May and June, then fed them green shop out in the pasture for much of the rest of the growing season. We installed a pipeline and put new stalls in the barn, and over time updated to better used equipment as cash flow would allow. We were all averse to borrowing money if it could be avoided, so we only bought what we could afford. 
I learned about intensive grazing, and we started breaking the pastures up into smaller, somewhat smaller paddocks back in the 1980s. But there was no organic milk market in the state at the time, and so we produced milk conventionally through the 80s and well into the 90s. During that time, I experimented with banning herbicide to reduce its usage, and experimented with cultivating corn, and had some real messes when timing and cultivation wasn't good because of lack of knowledge and not having appropriate equipment. Five years into marriage, our daughter Carly arrived and was joined three and a half years later by our son, Kirk. Shortly after Carly became school age, and with a, with a year and a half of public school under her belt, we moved to homeschooling and followed the child-led learning philosophy. The children are sponges who willingly soak up knowledge on their own when provided with an environment rich in people, nature, books, and participation in real life activities. The home, the farm, the outdoors, and the greater community was their classroom through all their school years. As is the case today, the mainstream dairy farm push was for increased milk production, and we worked to that end. Our milk production rose during the 1980s, and in 1991, we decided maybe we could do a better job if we kept our highest producing cows and fresh cows off pasture and only fed them in the barn. So we did that for two years, and we did make more milk, but we also had more cow health issues and a much bigger feed bill. So in 1993, we decided to go back to grazing all the milking herd and to do it on a much more uh, intense level by giving them a new piece of pasture after every milking. We added crop acres into the pasture system so that we would have enough pasture to graze for much more of the growing season. That first intensive grazing season was stressful. We watched milk production decline as we attempted to learn the art of intensive grazing. But we also saw our feed bill drop more than the milk production loss, and we found our health greatly improving in the herd. The following spring, we couldn't wait to get back the cows back out onto pasture. So we added even more cropland to the grazing system to have enough acreage to keep the cows out onto pasture until November. We were hooked on grazing as the way we wanted to farm. <coughs> A few years later, we had the opportunity to purchase 150 acres of contiguous flat farmland just up the road from us. Unfortunately, a lot of, about a third of it does flood, so it may not be quite as good as it looks, but it's still an awfully nice piece of land. An opportunity like that doesn't come along uh, very often, so we embraced it and purchased the land. We looked into moving to organic production at that time thinking that land could make us feed self-sufficient. But the organic milk, the organic market for milk in New York State was only in its infancy at <coughs> that time. And the only buyer of organic milk would only guarantee paying a premium on 25% 20, of your milk. So they, even though you were producing it all organically, 75% uh, may still receive uh, the conventional price. So the economics didn't pencil out for us, so we passed on that. And decided instead to start expanding our herd through internal growth. The first winter, we outwintered the cows that wouldn't fit in the barn. And then the following year, we built a 32-cow, 32 32-stall 32 freestall barn, still milking in our dry stall barn and switching the cows back and forth between the two barns. Around that time, Rick saw an ad in Country Folks newspaper looking for organic milk, $19 per 100 pounds of milk or $5 per 100 weight over the conventional price, whichever was higher, we had read. Now that got our interest and led to the start of our transition. So on May 1st, 1998, we started shipping organic milk, a decision we've never regretted. Three years later, in 2001, 
I traveled to Vermont to attend a summit meeting for the organic <coughs> dairy producers in the Northeast. The meeting was spurred by the fact that a processor was threatening to terminate contracts if producers didn't voluntarily submit to lowering their contracted pay price. NADPA, the Northeast Organic Dairy Producers Alliance, was birthed at that meeting and has become a farmer-driven organization that advocates for a sustainable pay price for organic milk and works to protect the integrity of the USDA organic regulations. I've been heavily involved in NAMPA over the years and know it has had a very real and positive effect both on the organic dairy <coughs> market from the far farmer perspective, but that it has also been a vehicle to bring our farmer voice to the National Organic Standards Board and the National Organic Program. NAMPA has sister organizations in the West and Midwest and we all came together to work for the pasture rule, as well as having worked together on the uh, origin of livestock rule, which hopefully will be coming out soon. We as farmers can have little impact on the bigger picture as individuals, but when we come together into farmer-driven organizations, that scale of voice with a cohesive message can accomplish much. Thankfully, so many people here have devoted countless amounts of time, effort, energy, and put work into no organizations like NOFA New York and NOTFA and many others that have truly made a difference. I urge any of you who can and are able and aren't yet involved to get involved to whatever extent possible. We need to protect what gains have been made and to keep moving ahead to decrease pesticide use, to work for better soil health and stewardship, to prevent the desecration of our air and water, to continue to grow the market and the production of nutritious organic food that can nurture consumers to a better state of health. In 2001, after having attended a meeting on farm business structure, we decided to transform our business into a, I guess that ended up being blank, into a limited liability company. We worked with a farm credit consultant and a well-versed attorney. We knew how to choose this time. We left all our farm real estate in the original partnership and created a new entity called Twin Oaks Dairy LLC to own the cows, the equipment, and the inventory. The benefit of putting an operating business into an LLC is that that is the aspect of business that has the most chance for potential liability. If a catastrophe strikes and we were to get sued, we could lose all the assets under the LLC, but any assets like our homes, which were owned individually, or the farm real estate, which is owned by the partnership, could not be tapped in a lawsuit against the LLC. It was also at this time that Rick and I planned and signed living wills, health care proxies, power of attorneys, and updated our wills. A living will specifies what kind of medical intervention you do or don't want once certain guidelines that you have set have been met. It sounds like a lot of work, but any good attorney will already have templates available that you just may need to revise a little bit, or maybe it'll fit you right to a T. In a healthcare proxy, you assign someone the authority to make medical decisions on your behalf should you become unable to do so. A power of attorney does the same thing for all things legal. <clears throat> and of course, a will establishes how you will want your physical and financial assets to be dispersed should you pass away. If you don't have a will in place, your estate will need to be probated through the courts, which is a lengthy and a public process, and may in no way distribute the, your estate the way you would have wanted it to be. These documents should be reviewed every few years or every several years, or when there's a change takes place. For example, if the person that you designated as your health care proxy has chronic disease, or your children grow up and 
they can fill one of these roles that as a minor they couldn't. Having these documents in place not only is a safety measure for yourself, but they will be a big help to your family. That you have prepared guidance and a legal framework for decisions to be made so they do not have to make difficult and possibly heart-rending decisions in a vacuum or deal with a crisis if something happens to incapacitate you and there is no power of attorney or will. Without them, financial assets can become frozen and can lead to business failure. In the summer of 2003, we installed a 5.3 kilowatt photovoltaic system at our house that was pole mounted and could be manually tilted to capture the best angle of the sun for the change of seasons. By that fall, Rick began noticing the loss of dexterity in his right hand and loss of movement in his right arm. We started visiting doctors to try to track down the cause. By January of 2004, he received the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. That began our long journey between conventional neurologists and alternative practitioners to do anything we could to slow the progression. In the fall of 2005, we took a trip to Switzerland, Rick's father's homeland, while Rick was still able to make such a trip. We had a wonderful time, and unless you are a flatlander, you can't help but fall in love with the magnificent beauty of the country. Another piece of advice, do not wait too long to do things that are important to you because they may become impossible with the passage of time. Over the years, I was involved in many farm, off-farm endeavors, as Mary Rose alluded, uh, from my town to county to state to national things, so I won't go through them again. But I do have to thank my two partners, Rick and Bob, for taking up the farm work slack while I was away. In 2007, I did succumb to uh, encouragement to run for the Cortland County Legislature and was on the legislature for six years. I learned much about the good and the not so good of county government. But while I was in that capacity, uh, the fracking controversy erupted and I became an advocate against it. My elected position did allow me a somewhat bigger platform in the debate, that the statewide debate to turn back the seemingly coming tide of fracking in New York State. That again did happen because so many of you and others throughout the state and beyond got involved and said, no, we don't want to work that our water, our health, our livelihoods, or our families. In 2009, a 27.6 kilowatt photovoltaic system was mounted on poles with two-way tracking was finally installed on our farm after having been in the works for the prior few years. The system became operational in 2010. Although it has not reduced our purchased electricity for the farm to zero, as the system was sized to do, it has reduced it by close to two-thirds. By this time in our lives, our daughter Carly had long moved on to City Life, where she interned at the Center for Food Safety in D.C., then moved on to Philadelphia, where she became involved in the food scene. Our son Kirk had become an instrumental part of the farm labor scene and took on growing farm responsibilities as Rick's decreased. Although Rick had been able to continue working as he long had during the first few years of the Parkinson's diagnosis, with time came increasing disability and the need to revise what jobs he did. Then as time went on, we had to restrict and supervise what he did. <laughs> At the same time, his brother, our farming partner, had growing issues with his hands and shoulders and started exhibiting poor judgment around the farm. It was a difficult time. 
Imagine how to deal with situations where someone can no longer competently do what they have done for decades, and yet they are an owner of the business, and yet are not really aware of their lack of proficiency. And none of us really understood what was going on. I have to credit our son, Kirk, with coping with and managing this challenge, probably to a greater extent than I did, given what areas we each mainly worked on in the farm. For sure, it was a real trial on many levels for a fairly 20-year-old to deal with his father and uncle under these circumstances, especially when the dream had been for father and son to farm together. This confluence prompted a gathering of advisors from Farm Credit, FarmNet, our attorney's office, our accountant, and family members. With their guidance, we went through farm transfer work and both my 30-year partners exited from the business as owners, and Kirk became an owner-operator. Although moving into that role at age 22 may have not been ideal, it fit the circumstances of need, and Kirk became my very able and responsible business partner. Because we had buy-sell procedures and methods already set up in our partnership agreement and the LLC agreement, <coughs> for such transitions to happen, there was no crisis. There was just a working out of details and carrying things through. Both Bob and Rick actually continued to work for us as employees doing select jobs for a time as long as they were able. A year later, I took Rick to the University Hospital in Rochester for him to be evaluated for deep brain stimulation surgery, where fine wires are placed down into the brain and hooked to a stimulator to help with Parkinson's symptoms. The final evaluation by the neuro team there was that Rick was not a candidate for DVS surgery. He had something more than Parkinson's. They didn't know what, but called it Parkinson's Plus and told us they were sorry, but there was nothing they could do to help. More disability continued to accrue for both Rick and Bob. In 2012, Bob was tentatively diagnosed with ALS. Then genetic testing showed he had a genetic mutation for frontotemporal brain degeneration, FTD in shorthand, which can be and was partnered with ALS. Bob's genetic testing results and the knowledge that their dad had died young after several years of dementia prompted genetic testing of Rick. He also was positive for the same genetic mutation for frontotemporal degeneration as well as Parkinson's. These last few years was when the other legal documents that I mentioned earlier came into play for us. As Rick's cognition diminished, I needed to exercise the power of attorney to take care of his finances and other legal matters. I needed to exercise the health care proxy to make medical decisions. And both Bob and Rick's living wills came into play when they each declined last year to the point of being unable to swallow. Their living wills spelled out no feeding tubes, no IVs, once they reached that point. So there were no trips to the hospital at Lake Sen. There were no heroic interventions. There were calls to hospice to provide palliative care. They each stayed in their own homes, in their known environment, cared for by their families and with their family members at their sides at the time of each was passing. So evolution, our families have evolved much to our sorrow and loss. Our lives have evolved, much to our sorrow and loss. The farm has evolved, much to our sorrow and loss of how we had dreamed it would all go. But we who are still here and living have to continue on, even with the empty space in our hearts. Rick and Bob's parents started this farm in the 1930s, and Kirk and I are continuing this now third generation farm, looking to the future, 
to evolve into a more efficient farm with a continuing viability well into the future. I was very pleased with the comment that Kurt made to me this year, that if he had to farm conventionally, he would no longer want to farm. I'm thankful that he is committed to the organic way, as I am. But I'm also thankful that my daughter and son-in-law, Carly and Dave, moved next door a year and a half ago and have established their food and ferments certified kitchen in the former workshop of my house. Smells wafted up from their kitchen of the fermenting sauerkrauts, kimchi, ginger brew, <coughs> beet kebabs, and other specialty handcrafted ferments. And whenever our fridge becomes empty of Kirk's and my favorite krauts, the sea king and curry, we only need to pop downstairs and snatch a couple fresh jars out of the walk-in cooler. <laughs> and so ends the telling of the relevant highlights of my formative experiences, the environment that shaped me, and my evolution that brought me to this point, to be here today, to feel so very honored to receive the Nova New York Farmer of the Year Award. So I want to close by reading you the overview of Don Miguel Ruiz's Five Agreements. When I was first exposed to the little book, it was only four agreements, but the fifth that has been added is just as worthy and valuable as the rest. They are such cogent and powerful guidelines in how to be, whether it's as a parent, an employer, an elected official, a volunteer, a member of the community or the world in all aspects of our lives. I'm sure many of you are already very familiar with these agreements, agreements that are with ourselves. And I read verbatim from Don Miguel Ruiz. Number one, be impeccable with your word. Speak with integrity. Say only what you mean. Avoid using the word to speak against yourself or to gossip about others. Use the power of your word in the direction of truth and love. Two, don't take anything personally. Nothing others do is because of you. What others do, say, and do is a projection of their own reality, their own dream. When you are immune to the opinions and actions of others, you won't be the victim of needless suffering. Three, don't make assumptions. Find the courage to ask questions and to express what you really want. Communicate with others as clearly as you can to avoid misunderstandings, sadness, and drama. With just this one agreement, you can completely transform your life. Four, always do your best. Your best is going to change from moment to moment. It will be different when you are tired as opposed to well rested. Under any circumstance, simply do your best and you will avoid self-judgment, self-abuse, and regret. And number five, be skeptical but learn to listen. Don't believe yourself or anybody else. Use the power of doubt to question everything you hear. Is it really the truth? Listen to the intent, intent behind the words, and you will understand the real message. Invaluable agreements and principles, for sure. So I want to give a huge thank you to my daughter, Carly, for looking through myriads of photos and putting them together for this presentation. Thanks to my son, Kirk, for being at home, keeping all things running at Twin Oaks Dairy. I want to acknowledge the presence of my niece, one of Bob's daughters, who is here today. And after receiving an education at Princeton, has gone back to school for a degree in sustainable agriculture. And my thanks to all of you for sharing in my evolutionary journey and being a, many of you being a partner along the way.